I'm Noel Mead and I'm from North County Mead in Castletown, uh, bred, born and reared, never moved any further than where I am now. My um, parents' house is about 200 yards away at the end of the avenue and I've been living here for the, since the last 50 years. Absolutely no horses involved in the family at all, nobody had anything to do with horses. Uh, the first horse that we got was I, from the time I was very young, I was horse mad and we eventually convinced dad to buy his pony and uh, he ended up buying a mare at the spring show, a Connemara mare, a Connemara mare and uh, that was the first horse or four-legged horse other than working horses that were on the farm. It certainly wasn't in the pedigree anyway on either side because uh, um, neither mum nor dad had anything to do with horses. Uh, my father had a brother who was interested in going racing. He was a very good footballer in his time. Ted Mead, he was my godfather and uh, he used to bring me racing a bit. And I had another uncle on the other side, on my mother's side, my mother's brother, who was very interested in horses. And I suppose, to be honest, his, uh, Tom Halpin was his name. Uh, he probably had more to do with it than a lot of people because he brought brought us racing and himself and his son, his own son James and myself used to go racing quite a bit together when we were kids. And uh, it all sort of went from there. Well, of course, being a farmer, my father couldn't wait to get her in foal, so she bred a foal every year. And, and then we had then we had ponies because we had, we had, uh, he covered her with, uh, um, a thoroughbred a couple of times, and he co covered her with with uh, with uh, a half Arab horse that was in in Blackwater House in in Kells. In a, in he was being used as a teaser, and of course he used him. And she she bred a few very sharp ponies, who one of them was particularly good uh, show jumper, all right, and and. Uh, a couple of the other ones, one was very good, a very good racing pony, uh, which was how we started off racing. And uh, she was, she was, a, she was by a thoroughbred and um, she was just under 15 hands. So she used to scrape into the under 15 hand races and uh, she was my first race horse really. When we, when I started racing off first, we were going to sort of Jim Cannes and whatever, and that was fine. It, it, you were able to ride her because the fact that you're a bit bigger and heavier didn't make any difference because the tracks were very small. And uh, then we moved up a step and we started going to the bigger meetings and it became very apparent that I was too heavy for that job. So uh, the first guy that we employed at that stage was uh, dead now, John Burke. Uh, he was a school teacher son in Nobber. And he ended up going to Fred Rymel and winning a Gold Cup and a National in one year. And uh, he died when he was 40, unfortunately. Nice fella. And then the second one that uh, took over when John went off was Raymond Carroll. And Raymond was a kid at the time and he, used to, he was in Gormanston. And uh, James Halpin, who was my cousin, he was in Gormanston as well. So James introduced... Um, uh, Raymond into the scene, so we used to bring pick up Raymond and bring him off to the to the pony with the pony, and we'd all head off. And the other fellow that used to come was was Con Power, who was in Gormanston as well at the time, and that uh, was great fun. It was a mix of of uh, cattle, mostly mostly we uh, dry stock, we, we uh, suckle our herd as well, and and sheep and uh, a little bit of tillage, but mostly mostly dry stock. My father would be, so, I suppose in one respect, he was a cattle dealer really. Uh, he, he, he would spend his time going, he'd do two marts a week and he'd be constantly buying cattle and selling. And I, I used to spend a lot of time with him, going to, going to sales and whatever. Well, my godfather played for Meath and he was on the Meath team that was beaten in the 39 All-Ireland final by Kerry. So he was always hoping that he had, that it, because his own two sons were no good. He thought maybe I was going to be the one, but I was playing in a match on the on the on a Sunday, and, and uh, usually an under fifteen match at the local sports in the, at the next village over Gibstown, mm -hmm. and uh, it was the first time that my mother had come to see me play, and uh, that evening when we came home and we were having our supper, uh, she sort of 
stooped in beside me and she said, Noel, she said, do you remember when I was telling you to keep away from the ball so you wouldn't get hurt? I didn't really mean it. <laughs> so that was kind of the end of my footballing career. There was about 10 or 12 of us around the area who had ponies. And we used to organise our own race meetings at different farms. There were nearly all farmer sons and whatever. And we used to organise our own race meetings and, and whatever and we'd go from one to the other so we, we grew up hunt, going hunting on, at the, on the holidays and well, any chance we got and uh, from then we sort of graduated up to the pony racing and then uh, this pal of mine a guy called Mick Condra he uh, lives down the road he's a dairy farmer as well and myself bought a horse called Tuva and he in Goffs he had been pin fired he'd won a race in the park at the time uh, it was by King's Bench and he was seven I think at the time when we bought six or seven when we bought him and he as I say he had been pin fired and he wasn't much of a horse really he was he was um he was running around. I, ro- I was riding him and training him, and we were travelling around courtesy of CIE because they used to bring the horses racing for, for nothing. The racing board had a, a, a funded CIE, and uh, it was a, sort of there was a, a transport grant for bringing them. So we, we loaded up and went off with CIE here, there, and everywhere. So he, he as I say, he wasn't a great horse, but he was always placed, and so he was a kind of a cash machine for us because we didn't really have much money and I was riding him for nothing and we were getting every time he'd run he was in the first three. He only won a couple now, he won in Wexford, uh, I won a maiden hurdle on him in Wexford, I was after getting beat on him in Galway, Mouse Morris got, I jumped the last and looked like I was going to win and I kind of looked around to my left because I was after passing Mouse and Mouse got back up and beat, beat me then much to the disgust of my followers and then um, the next time he ran, then he won in Wexford. And uh, Dermot did, was second that day. I was very proud of that fact. But uh, I think everybody said to me, no, it's time to give that up. So I, I moved on to the training after that. And uh, that's what started. My father got very ill when I was about 16. And uh, I came home from school then. I was, I was in, in an, an agricultural college down in, in Multifarnham. And when he got very ill, I came home to r- more or less run the place. And there was, there was a quite a big farm at the time. So I was uh, uh, going out buying cattle when I was 16 or 17, you know, and, and this, that and the other. So I don't know how good a farmer I was, probably not great. But anyway, we kept the thing rolling along until he got better. And then he came back into the scene again. But during that period, I, as I said, I was a pony racing period. And then we moved on to the to the Tuva period, I suppose. And uh, it sort of grew from there. A complete accident, really. Um, I suppose, like every kid, when you're grown up, you wanted to be a jockey. Like when I was six foot one and I wasn't really built to be a jockey and probably wasn't, anyway, wasn't good enough to be a jockey. But, but um, I... When, when it was, became apparent I wasn't going to be a jockey, I sort of decided to train, but I didn't really think that I was going to train. I didn't think that it was going to be, you know, didn't really think about it. It was just the kind of the way it went. And um, I, first of all, like I had to, and then someone asked me to take a horse. And I think the first year we had, I had about four or five horses, by four winners. And, 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 uh, it, and I never, I never actually trained anywhere else. I was, I was never with anyone else. I, I never, I never, um, I never spent any time, which I often thought was a pity, really, that I didn't. And then, maybe in another respect, it wasn't because you, you didn't learn anyone else's habits. You just made up your own as you went along. So, as a, as I progressed and year on year things were getting bigger. And uh, like the first winner, I think, was in 1971. And in 1977, I had a winner at Royal Ascot. So it did sort of balloon quick enough. In fact, it was, it was, uh, it was hard to keep up building stables because I had none when I started. And I was, I was the chief uh, 
bottle washer. I was the the builder and the roofer and the do- and the carpenter and the trainer and the, and running the farm as well. So it was busy time. I think the first year we had four, and I think I had I, I had four again or five or six the next year, and then it grew and then it went up to probably twelve. And then and next year I went to uh, probably 24. It, it, and then it started when I got to, when I got to 75 or six, at that stage, it sort of ballooned a bit when it, we got a very good filly called Sweet Mint. Uh, she was belonging to my brother-in-law and she won in Royal Ascot and she won uh, stakes races in the Cora and, 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 uh, and the Phoenix Park. She was very good in the park. So we had, it was, it went, it went along then. I got horses from mostly flat ones from quite a lot of people then. At that stage, people were sending me, but wasn't really buying any as, as such. They were just coming along. And then as that progressed, I started buying and sort of, uh, I suppose, probably got up to, you know, what it seemed to be a very big string at the time doesn't anymore but at the time I think probably got up to 70 or 80 horses and when we got up to that that was a, that was a huge that was a huge string mostly flat mixture I've trained anything anyone would send me to be honest with you uh, but mostly flat and and uh, I I bought flat horses rather than jumpers I like I bought and always bought the yearlings biggish uh, and always rarely bought horses to be early either. I usually bought horses that had uh, mile or mile pedigrees at least because my plan at the time was that if I bought them big enough that if they weren't good enough to be flat horses they'd be jumpers and uh, it worked very well now it did actually work very well and we came across a few very good dual purpose horses at that time and uh, the, that that system worked out like the I remember, I, don't, I can't remember which year it was because I, I just I'd have to look it up, but uh, one year we trained more winners than anybody else. And I think that was about 79 or 80 winners. And that was jumping and flat. We trained more winners than anyone else in Ireland. You know, it's laughable when you think about it now, when you think like Willie uh, is well over 200 at the moment and Gordon is well over 200 as well. And, and it's quite incredible. But then there's so much more racing now than there used to be. Like we were at that time, you we were talking about racing probably on a Thursday, Saturday, and and you know you had no Sunday racing at that stage, and and you were talking about as I say, two days a week most weeks, and then until the festivals came along, or maybe the likes of the summer you had those those uh, Kilbegan meetings or Sligo or places like that, but there wasn't the, there wasn't the amount of racing that there is now, and uh, like who were we against? Sure, we were against Vincent was the was the big man uh, and um, I was I was trained when when Darkie was training now I suppose more so Kevin who was a big was a big thing John Ox of course and and uh, um, and I actually trained against uh, John's father not that he was running it rather than John at the start and um, and uh, who else had we then sure we had we had uh, uh, Stephen Quirk was training, um, Tony Redmond, quite a few fellas like that, you know. Things have changed and like obviously uh, the size of Aidan's operation or, or should I say the O'Brien operation is huge, you know, like I mean uh, Joseph has has an enormous string of horses now but that's just the way the whole thing has gone and I think I don't suppose in one respect there's much difference really. It was very hard to win then too, so it was. There was no easy races at that stage. And um, when you went over jumps it was the same thing, you know, like you had you had uh, Tom Draper and then then Jim and, and, and uh, uh, the Mako was strong at the time and Francis Flood and whatever. There was like there were strong maybe maybe there, it wasn't quite as, as competitive. Well it, it, it couldn't have been because that that time, those horses that were winning, not po- so much point to points. I suppose Tom Costello was the guy that was selling the pointers, and they were going to they, they were and the odd Wexford, more more Cork, I suppose, than and and the Costellos than Wexford that like today there is today, but but those horses 
uh, went to England. And the bumper winners at that time went to England. Like if you had a good bumper horse, and I remember winning a bumper with a, a, a nice horse in Nace, and I think he was sold for about fifteen or sixteen thousand, which was a lot of money at the time. And and uh, he went. He, all those horses went to England. So nowadays it's completely the opposite. Like those, the good horses are staying here. Not so much even staying here. They're coming here. Like I mean, they're constantly coming here from France. They're constantly anything that might even win in England, that looked good could come here and. That that has changed the whole thing around a lot. Oh, Stephen Crane was the first jockey I had. Uh, he was the first one that that, that uh, came. Oh, Stephen was with me for a good few years. We had great times together. Uh, he was he was great. We had a, we had a couple of very good summer horses at that time. Uh, a horse called Pinch Hitter. He won the McDonough Handicap in Galway twice, and he won the Galway Hurdle twice, and he won he won in Galway as a two year old. He was he was actually only beaten once, I think, and that was in the his third time in the McDonough Handicap, he got beaten ahead and, and he was, car- obviously at that stage he'd gone up in the weights, he was carrying top weight and he got pushed out on the bend and he probably ran better in the race that year than he did in any of them. But he was an extraordinary horse because he only really came right for that sort of week in the year. He, was, he wanted fast ground and yet I think at the time he used to have a water stable and he spent more time in the water stable than he did because he had a suspensory problem all his life. And uh, he, he just, for some reason or another, he used to come right for Galway and uh, maybe maybe down to Tralee as well. I think he won the big hurdle in Tralee as well. But, but um, and then we had another horse called Steel Duke, who was a real Galway specialist as well. He won the amateur race and he won the, he won the race on the Friday twice and he won the, he won another couple of races, the a condition race in Galway and he won the, 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 there was another big handicap in Galway on the Monday, he won that. And he ended up actually just getting touched off in the group two in the Cora in, in, in after winning, I think, about six in a row on handicaps. Now he was he started off as a bumper horse, so he was he was he, he was six, I think, when he was running on the flat, and uh, he he was a very good horse. And funny he was the, when he got beat that day at the Cora, one of Vincent's beat him, and they drew about seven or eight lengths, maybe four that cleared the third. And it was ding dong, a beat ahead, and it absolutely killed him. He was never the same horse after that race. He w- he just couldn't believe he got beaten because he was after winning, I think, seven in a row, and he just he was down and out. And he, I don't think he ever re- really recovered from that run, even though he won again after that. But and peculiarly enough, he wasn't a great. He he was a very good jumper, but he w- he had to think too much about it. He went up in the air. He won over fences and he won over hurdles, but. He went up in the air and spent too much time jumping, and it, he was obviously it, it it just didn't work for him, and it, it took much, a lot out from jumping, and he was only an ordinary jumper. I had a horse called Fane Ranger. He was a very good horse. Uh, he was he was a super horse. He he was I I never forgave the handicapper for it. He was he was beat, he was second in the Gal- in the Galway hurdle. He won. He he won quite a lot of races through the year but he didn't like real heavy sticky ground he liked good ground but he was second in the Galway hurdle and the horse that beat him was an English horse beat him who the handicapper left in very light and in actual fact CEO then was the champion hurdler at the time and if the if the CEO then had been in the race I, I'd have been giving him three pound I think was fine range so it was that, that on the ratings the way he had the way he had put the other horse in so he went and beat him in that. I was, it was night. But he was, when I look, think back on him now, he was, when he'd been training for three months, he just would become impossible to train. He started losing weight and we could never work out what was wrong. And it's only now when we see the effect that ulcers have on horses that we realise exactly what was wrong with him. So the poor devil had ulcers all his life, I'd say. When, and when he was in training for a while, he just used to, to go back and whatever. But he was, he was a very, very good horse. Most of my horses that raced over jumps came from flat racing, came from flat. So most of them wanted goodish ground. So at that time, you were in those horses were running in Galway and, and Wexford and all those summer tracks, then Tralee and, and Killarney and whatever. And a lot of the horses went round the went round the summer circuit rather than in the winter. When the winter came, we were in trouble. We couldn't keep up with the with the, with the heavy flatters. But but um, that was probably why 
I I would have been in, in the likes of those those country tracks. And uh, like to be honest, a lot of those horses they won a lot of races, but they weren't a lot of them weren't much good. They weren't great horses, you know. But they won they won races because they were they were went on some ground and whatever, you know. Well, up to the end of the national hunt season in Punchestown, I think it's right that the ground in Fairy House and Punchestown is kept right for jumping horses because they're jumping meetings. I think it would be a mistake for Galway to be watered to a situation where it's going anything other than good. I think that's not fair on the on the horses that you're talking about in the summer and the summer ground should have summer some like but good ground like we did get we did it in the early back in the 70s and 80s the ground was like flint when it got hard there was no watering and it was very very hard and and it was it wasn't right so like horses you wouldn't dream of running a, a big jumping horse on it nowadays you could because they they keep the ground pretty good but i think it's right that the ground is kept right for for the, those meetings up the spring in at those fairy house for instance and punchestown punchestown is a fabulous festival and it has to be it's a jumping festival with jumping horses you know i was doing the entries for the curra one day and I was just looking at it and I said, geez, I all I have to enter is in handicaps. I've no and I've no chance. Like uh Aidan hadn't got into Bally Doyle, but Bally Doyle was getting stronger. Uh the Arabs were just after moving in big time. The Aga Khan was after moving a lot of horses into into Ireland, into John Ox. And Dermot had my lair and it was getting stronger and stronger. And I thought at the time I just said to myself, if I switch towards jumpers, I I had a few good clients at the time that could buy horses. And for the sort of money that I, at that time, if you had 70 or 80 or 100 grand, it, 100 grand was massive. Like, so if you were if you were able to get up to even 70, 60, 70, you could buy a, a, a very decent horse. So we, we switched completely. We switched completely and stopped buying the Irlands and started buying jumpers. And it worked it really worked well and a lot of those jumpers were horses that we bought off the flat we bought a lot of horses in france and we bought them in bought them in england we bought them everywhere and and uh, it worked very well we didn't bring in any any french jumpers we brought in french flat horses uh, there wasn't the competition at that stage from america or from the australians that there is now you could buy, like if you went to the, the horse and train sales in Newmarket, you could buy probably the best of it for, well, definitely 100, but probably even less. Like I'd say we came out of the, the ones we wanted for 75 and 80 grand, and we were able to buy them. Whereas nowadays, like that's a t- thing of the past completely, you know. Um, but we were able to buy the, those, and it, it just made the difference. And, and it meant we had horses like Sausalito Bay cost, he was. He came out of Baldings now, and I think he cost seventy-two thousand at the time, and he won the Supreme. And he look, he was an unlucky horse because he went and got a fall after winning the Supreme the following year round. Uh, he w- he slipped up turning. Oh no! Did he fall the third last in in um, Fairy House, and uh, he broke his pelvis, and he never really recovered from that. So, which was an awful pity because he was a very very good horse. Um, and uh, we like, but success brings success. Uh, like, and if you can keep it rolling, it, get, the more winners you get, the more horse you get, the more horse you get, the more winners you get. And if you can keep the thing rolling, that's the way it goes. And like, and to be fair, that's what's how the, how Willie has got so big, and Gordon has got so big, and and now Gavin is is coming along behind him, and that's how, uh, like, that's how they, they they did get so big, and that's uh, and that's the way it's worked. I was always still training a few flat horses at that stage. See, it took a while to change it over. But but because Pat Garvey had Sunshine Street and Pat sort of I lost Pat because I didn't have I didn't I didn't have uh, I'd stopped buying the flat horses and he was only interested in the flat. Ah, uh, Sunshine Street was a, mar- <laughs> was a marvelous uh, episode really because um, I never forget uh, he Pat always wanted to ha- he wanted to have a Derby horse have a Derby horse and we bought Sunshine Street off uh, Camus off Timmy Hyde for 64, 66,000, I think, in Goffs. And uh, I'll never forget, uh, he he ran, he was second as a two-year-old, beautiful-looking horse, he was a lovely big horse, and he came out as a three-year-old, and he was second, at, he might have been, 
I don't know, I think he'd only won one of the three. And he came out and he was second again in Leopardstown in this first run. And then he ran in the Derby trial. He was in the Epsom Derby and he ran the Derby trial and he finished second again. And uh, I was walking out of the parade ring and Michael Clower said to me as I was walking out, he said, uh, where will he go now, Nolan? And I said, well, he'll go to Epsom. So I, Michael, you see, it was the Derby trial. And uh, he said, Epsom. What did he go to Epsom for? I says, isn't that where they run the Derby? <laughs> and uh, it was funny the way it happened. So anyway, we were all gung-ho going to the Derby. And um, at the time, I was sort of thinking, well, look, could he run a good race? And, or hopefully he'll run a good race. And there'll be plenty in it and we'll beat a few. And that everybody be happy. So we got him as ready as we could and everything was set up to go to the Derby. And about... Uh, Ten days before the derby, Pat rang me and he said, "God, no!" He said, "You know, this is a very looks a very good race. It looks a very good derby. Are you sure we'll go?" And I said, "Oh, we'll go, Pat. We we'll definitely go. Yeah, we're going to go." He says, "Okay." He says, "That's fine." So then, about a couple of days later, and you know, I'm looking at the race, and and uh, Michael Stout is talking about the horse he has, the best horse he ever had, and Paul Cole is talking about the horse he had, the best horse he ever had. Henry Cecil is talking about his horse, it's a great horse, and the Arabs had something, or someone else had something, and everybody had the best horse they ever had. And Aidan decided to run three. He had the French Derby winner or Guineas winner, whichever it was, I can't remember. He had the, the the Dante winner, and he had the English Guineas winner in it. And uh, he was. They were talking there. There was a possibility Aidan might be first, second, and third. So anyway, we had, he was he wasn't a great traveller, and we sent him over by box, and he stayed with Jim Old for a couple of days when he went, when he was on his way to Epsom. Jim always maintained if he'd stayed with him a little longer he'd have won the Derby, but anyway. But he went down to he he went off from Jim's down to Epsom. And we flew over to to um, Gatwick and we stayed in a hotel in Gatwick and I got up that Derby morning and I was looking at the Brayson Post and uh, Sporting Life I think it was at the time. And uh, I was I was looking at them, and there were everybody, there was only 11 or 12 runners now. Everybody had pulled out, and like, I was sort of looking, and there's not one of these horses we're sure to beat, you know. So, uh, I was, we arrived at the track, and I said to Pat, we were walking down to the stable yard, he was coming down with me. I said, Do you know, Pat, he says, there's not one of these horses we're sure to beat. Oh, well, we're here now, Noel, he says, and we'll give it our best shot. I said, Yeah, that's fine, Grant. So anyway, Pat wanted him run, ridden positively, and Johnny rode him. Johnny Martha rode him, and Johnny kicked from the top of the hill, and he went about ten clear, maybe twelve clear. And uh, I'm up on the stand, and, and uh, we're after having lunch with all the the right people, and uh, I'm up on the in the box that was there for the derby owners and whatever, and uh, he turned in, and he's geez, a long way clear, and I sort of said, well. He got a bit of a shout anyway, so we got to the two pole, and he's still a long way clear. And I'm looking down under my glasses. I'm looking down anyway, and he's still he's still going well now, and he's 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 still eight or nine clear at this stage. And they get to between the two anyway, and I could see everybody else started to push, and my glasses started to open down in my hand like this. And he says, "So anyway, I had so the next thing I had to take them down. I couldn't keep them steady any longer. And he got to the furlong pole. So the, oh, sure, I nearly threw the." Poor, there was a shake beside me and nearly threw him off the stand roaring and, and he was beaten three lengths or just a little bit short of three lengths and he got pipped on the line for third um, oh, it's a high rise won it and, and uh, one of Balding's just nailed him a short head for third so anyway look we were, we were actually disappointed then because he, because he just got touched out of third but we went down 250 to one he was. we went down anyway and none of Aidan's finished in the first three and uh, I don't think they were in the first eight actually in the tournament but he won't like me saying that but that was the fact he's won it enough times since then. Uh, but anyway we went down and we were delighted and poor Colin Colin Murray who is gone now uh, had come over because I think they, they thought Aidan was going to be in the, to win the first three so RTE had sent over a camera so Colin comes galloping up to me anyway 
And he says, God, he ran great. No, he ran great. Yeah, he said he ran great. Did you expect him to do that? And I said, George Collin, you didn't. You came over for the fresh air, did you? So anyway, Pat Garvey turns around to me and he said, I never saw a fella change his tune so much in a couple of hours. He says, I should. Anyway, it was a good day. And we travelled around the world where he was third in the English Ledger and he went over and he was fifth in the Breeders' Cup and he, um, he eventually went, he eventually won a, uh, he won a stakes race in Leopardstown. He didn't get time to run in a, an ordinary race, he was, he, was spent his, he was going on his travels and he eventually won a, a group one in California for, he went over and he stayed with Neil Drysdale and he won a group one with him in, in uh, California and he came back here and he stood at stud not where he didn't do any good but he was he was he was a, an interesting time. Sweet Mint was a great filly. She was she was a good filly. She won the Cork and Orrery now and she was she was she was a very good filly. Probably didn't realise how good she was when I had her at the time. Uh, like it was very early on I didn't didn't understand her. And then I had a very good filly called Lassamana. She just got beat in the Irish Guineas. Uh Leicester beat her in one of Vincent's. And uh, with a couple of good fillies, another filly placed in the Guineas as well, um, and I had a good horse called Little Bighorn. He was he was fourth in the Irish Derby. He was fourth in the Irish Guineas as well, and uh, no, they were they were good horses. Well, national hunt horses take a lot more work, a lot more work, and um, as I say, I never was with anyone else. Um, so I didn't, I didn't get their good habits or bad habits. It, it's something I would love to have been. I'd love to, I'd love to say, go and spend time with. The, the, like if I was a young fellow now and I was going to train, I would love to go and spend time with Willie or spend time with with, with Aidan or or whatever. I, I think it'd be great. To, and I'm not sure if going around the world is a great idea. I think if you're going to train in Ireland, you should learn how to train in Ireland and go and train with that. But jumping horses take a lot more work. Because uh, you have to teach them how, to, and you have to teach them how to jump, and they have to stay. Um, I met a guy. He came to me uh, when there, the start of the time when I went back to the jumpers, and he, he, he was a um, English fella, uh, not sort, of, not sort of man. I can't think of his name now, but he had he was worked for the athletics. Uh, English athletics. He was a coach with them, and he—I don't know—something happened. And he, he, he sort of he he pulled away from it. And I, he came to me at the races one day and asked me could he come and talk to me. So he came down and he had a lot of ideas about training horses, and he certainly tr changed a, a lot of the things we did after that. Um, he we started doing a lot uh, shorter work, sharper work, and changed and basically you are doing intervals uh, it it worked very well the problem with it was that he wanted to do so much and you couldn't tell a horse that he was being prepped for whatever so, yeah, so I, 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 he 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 definitely had a big bearing on my time as in training but I I sort of chopped it and changed it so it, it suited the way I, I took in a lot of what he said, but I also put in a bit of my own as well. But he did he did change his mind a, a, a lot, and I, I think, to be honest, I think uh, Willie trains a lot that way on on intervals, and, and intervals are probably the the main thing with the with the. Asher Martin was Martin was was ahead of his time in everything. You know, he was he's a, he's a great man, and he's he's I was over with him last year. And I, Gordon and myself went and spent a night with him, and he's a very interesting man to talk to. Now, but I remember he coming here one time. I, I don't know whether he came to look at a horse or something or whatever, and I had him in the sitting room inside, and I spent I I, I was asking questions asking questions and after about an hour or so I apologised to him I said for uh, I said for you know being born and he said you're not born he said because I, I he said uh, I was just wanting to find out what you did he said I know exactly what you wanted to find out but he said he, I enjoyed talking and he, you know, he would he, he enjoyed Martin was one of those people that enjoyed talking to people about training and he had his own ideas and he loved to hear other people's ideas and he still does he's incredible so he is I had a very good friend called um, called uh, John O'Mara 
and he, he, John unfortunately died with cancer. But about 12 or 14 years, oh no, it's long, I don't know, good while ago now. And, uh, but John was a great pal, and, and I used to speak to John every day. But the, himself and two of his pals had a horse called Johnny Set Aside. And he was a very good horse. He, was, he, he, won, the, he won the Ericsson Chase at Christmas, where Richard Dunwoody rode him. But he'd won, he'd won quite a lot of good races before that. But he'd, he'd won a uh, national trial. He ran in the three mile, in the three mile novice at Chelsea. Unfortunately, that year the ground was it was too quick, and he was a soft ground horse, and he and he didn't and he didn't, he didn't. Uh, pro- well, he was fifth, I think, but but he didn't perform as well as he could. Um, he was he he did want soft ground, but anyway, he, he came back and he won the he won the the following year he won the, the Ericsson. But when he was walking back in, he dropped dead. And uh, uh, there was there, there were great characters the fellas that owned him, but but uh, um, he as he was coming in, as I say, he dropped dead. And after the race, the the, the sponsors asked us up to the box to have a drink, even though the horse was gone. And because one of the lads was very was very uh, upset. And uh, he he couldn't he was he loved the horse so much and he couldn't he was getting very hard to get over it anyway, and he was sort of half whimpering into his drink you see, and John O'Mara turned around to him and he said, ah, Johnny he says would you ever dry up he says should look and he says didn't he have the goodness to win he says before he died, he said sure he said it could be worse he says sure it could be a wife or something like that, and God says Johnny he says get a wife anywhere where are we going to get another horse like that. So anyway, such was life, and I remember, I remember that was the start of Paul Carberry, and I, when we schooled him first of offences, I said, God, he's very good for a novice, isn't he? And Paul says to me, oh, he said, he jumped a lot of fences, I jumped a lot of fences on that fellow when he was a three-year-old, or a four-year-old when he came at the beginning. So yeah, Paul had him well schooled, so he was. I bought him in France, and uh, he was trained down south of France by a, a, a small French trainer, and he'd won about four on the flat. And when he was at the sales, he was at the sales in Deauville, and he was actually a bit lame. And I had to go home, and I asked Bobby Orion, would you buy him for me? And because I wanted, and Bobby said to me, but you know he's lame. And I said, yeah, but I don't think it's much. I think he's okay. I said, he'd be okay. And he said, when well, he says, I don't know, you shouldn't be buying a lame horse. And I said, no, I think he's going to be all right, you see. So, um, Anyway, I, I had to catch a flight and Bobby bought him for me. And Bobby's input into buying our horse was telling me that he's, he's lame. But every time he won, Bobby was down underneath on the, on the, in the, the paper bought by Bobby Ryan. They always laughed about that. But um, when he came first, when, when we started with him first, he wasn't getting home at all. He was, he was, he was, you know, he was. And I, said, I remember sending him down to Ned Gowan and I said, look, I said, there must be something stopping him. And uh, Ned sent him back, and he said, "No, there's nothing. He's okay." And so eventually, he ran again, and he it, it, he just wasn't finishing. So I said, I sent him back to Ned, and I told him I wanted him to, him hob, to hobnail him. And and uh, I said, "No matter what you think," I says, "To hobnail him anyway." I said, "See." So as soon as we hobbed him, they had him the side turned, and away he went. But it did. He did always suffer a bit from his wind, and, and uh, I have no doubt that that's why his head used to come up the way it was. He was putting his head up to try and get air. Now, I know people call him a rogue and call him this, that and the other, and so I suppose it was, but I think people have to realise just how little air you're getting when you're flat out and you have to put your head up like that. Any, anyone would become roguish if that happened. But anyway, look, he, he was a very good horse. He was the most brilliant jumper. I think he only made about one or two mistakes in his life. And his jockey and himself were a, a great combination because you know, Paul had absolutely total belief in him and total belief of him, of him jumping. Uh, I, there's photographs of him in the house here of him taking off so far away from hurdles you'd wonder. And Paul has perched up his neck like as if there's definitely no problem he's going to make it. But... Um, and I suppose it's one of the regrets in my life that I didn't put him over fences a year earlier. Every time he used to run in very soft ground, he'd go lame behind for a while. And again, we never found out why that was, which was 
maybe nowadays we would have. I think I think I think veterinary medicine has come on a, a good bit since that. And I think I think if we had him now, we would we we might have been able to find out a little more about that. But um, he was look at it, he was a special horse for me, and I still my favourite horse. He got beat by Straw Bear in that he won that he won that hurdle the Christmas hurdle twice, and he got beat ahead by Straw Bear. And Paul said after the I remember the, the I told people this before I was I, I've actually won that the Christmas hurdle in Kempton four times, and I've never been in Kempton because I never went over. And and uh, he won it twice and and. Uh, we won it with uh, Coney Eight, and we won it in, with another horse, I can't, which I can't remember his name now at the minute. But, but um, I won it with another one. But the Slippers rode him. But uh, he, when he got beat by Straw Bear, I was in Leopardstown, and he came to Leopardstown the following day, and, and I said to him, he never touched, he never hit him, you know. And I said to him, God, Paul, would you not have thought you should have given one or two anyway? And he looked at me, and I swear there was tears in his eyes when he said it to me. He said, "He said, why would I hit him?" He said, "He was doing his best." And you know that was Paul. He just loved the horse. He, he absolutely adored him. And I know there's a great story about after Cheltenham that I said to him, and it's true. It's very true. Uh, I, I I said to him after the race in Cheltenham, we went to Punchestown and we were up against uh, Colm's horse again and uh, uh, um, Hardy Eustace didn't run but the other lad did, um, Brave Inca and I said to Paul, now don't be messing about today, I says go, you see and I, of course he, Paul went going to the last and uh, he landed and went past him and Brave Inca got back up and beat him and he was very, very, very annoyed coming in and I was standing beside me and he roared at me from the top of the horse. The only words I think, but the only time Paul ever, I might have had a row with him but I don't think he ever had a row with me but he, he roared at me, don't ever tell me how to ride a horse like that again. Tell this me how to ride this horse again. And uh, he was very annoyed and he even put it in his book at the time that I was the whole lot. But look, he was right, he was he was he was right. If he rode him his way he'd have won and anyway, he didn't so Now I watched that race with Desi Hughes and, and uh Desi was standing beside me and when he jumped the last Desi can be patting the back and he says, Well done and then of course I had to turn around and pat him on the back and say, Well done and the other one came up. But 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 um Yeah, I should look at He was a very good horse. Like he was, he was, he went through that, and he he got injured in the champion hurdle that he was running for the million in. He he got injured early on in that race. I think but the hurdle passed the stands. He made a complete hash of it, and he done his leg, and and uh, that's why he ran there. And he was off for two years, and he came back, and he was even off for longer. And if you remember, he fell at the last upside hurricane fly. And and uh, he came home and he seemed fine. And uh, about ten days later, he was hacking up and he broke his leg straight in front of me, just as he was coming up. So he must have cracked it when he fell that day. I thought, but he was a very good horse. And uh, another very good horse was Aaron Concerto. He was a, he was a hell of a nice horse too. And he slipped the tendon. And of course, Harbour Pilot was a hell of a horse too. He was he was third in two Gold Cups. And and. Uh, he he was the problem with uh, Harbour was that that uh, he just missed one out. He was he was he was just he was going to win the Hennessy in Newbury, and he just took the last out of it and and, and and finished third. But he was he was a very good horse as well. So he was. The Bunny Boiler was probably the only horse that Paul never really got on with. Um, I do think Paul was probably as good a jockey as was, and if he if he was if he was if he was if he had. A different person. If he was Nina, they'd be talking about him for the rest of the gen the rest of the the, 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 the if, if Paul had uh, 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 Nina's uh, application, he would have that. But he was a brilliant rider, uh, and horses he could do things on, with horses, and horses would do things for him that you couldn't. But he could not get on with the bunny boiler. He was going to win the Thiestas on him, and he fell at second last. He was going to win somewhere. He fell. He just he. he Bunny Boyle had a complete blank brain, and when 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 that, so Ross won rode him in the in bottom weight. He rode him in the Paddy Power, and he was second. And uh, coming home, and then he rode him in the Irish National, and 
before he went to the Irish National, he won the Midlands National with Norman Williamson on him. And he was way out of the handicap. He had gone over to run in the Kimur and he missed the he missed getting in by by a few pounds. And we kept him there and he ran in the in the race on the Saturday and he won. He won very, very easily. And he was I think he was a stone wrong. I I, I it was a long way wrong, but there were the owners were adamant to let him run. And it, probably in hindsight it was right because he probably wouldn't run in the Irish National only for that. And he came back then and he won the Irish National with Ross on him. And Ross went way wide on him the whole way around. And, uh, but he jumped great for him. And in fair until the last, and he came to the last. And, and again, Desi was standing beside me. Desi and myself always used to watch the National together. And that's coming to the last, the same thing he said to me, well done. And he going to the last. And he, I don't know how he stood up. I really don't. He, and a fair play to Ross Garrett, he, he did some job st- staying on that horse that day because he was, his head was on the ground and he was, his tail is up. There's a photograph of it. If you ever see it, you get, you get it hard to believe how he could have stood up. But he had a great engine, so he had. And Panorama was a very good horse, but he wanted, uh, he wanted uh, very soft ground. And when he went over, to, he, was, he was after having a great season, he'd won the, won the race in Leopardstown and he was, he was over in Cheltenham and I didn't want to run him and his owner insisted that he'd run and it was a disaster because he, he came home with a leg and he shouldn't have run because the ground was too, I, I, was, I was fuming over it but I, I, he, he more or less said to me that if he didn't run he was taking him away so I said and when he was staying next door to me I said to Willie when he says you better run him so I said run him and I said to Paul going out I said Can I, don't be hard on him now I said unless you have a chance and because he was such a big horse and he was he and he'd never run on fast ground before and he'd never been sore he actually was letting himself down and, he, and, and of course then that's when you do the damage because the ground was too quick for him but he was he was a very good horse, uh, and and would have you know he, in soft ground he was capable of being anywhere. Probably would have been a, in a horse that might have been a national horse in time. In, in, in time. Uh, Pandorama, um, Nick and was a very good horse. He was he he was he beat Denman in the in the in the whatever you call it, and unfortunately got a touch in the leg then after that, and that was. He won again, all right, but he didn't. He didn't. That it was never as good. It did Ah, oh, he was. He was a very good horse. Oh, very, very good horse. And and uh, he he um, he fell in the champion hurdle. Barry fell at the third last that that year. But he won the Royal Bond, and he won. He he didn't. He didn't get to Cheltenham as a novice, I think went the following year and then the next year round he was going to the races the day before he went to the races the he won the Irish Cesaro which Pat Smullen rode him and he was going to the race and we said we'd give him a pop and he always rolled out in bandages because he used to he was a little bit turned out and he used to bang his joints a bit and we, he had bandages on him and we said we'd give him a pop before he went and didn't he cut his tendon straight across that was the end of him. He was oh, he was a very nice horse, and he was I'd say he was only halfway to what he was going to be because he was getting he was bred by we bought him off the Arabs off Godolphin, and he was a very very well bred horse, but he was getting better all the time. When Barney Corley, ha, he had a a farm in in uh, a farm in Mullingar, and he wanted to sell it, and at the time he wasn't, so he decided he'd raffle it. And he was selling tickets for a thousand each, and basically Bar- Barney was going to get a million for this when he had all the tickets sold. So a, an owner of mine, Michael Coburn, who's great, the great pal of mine, he was he lived down in the border. He's gone now, God rest him. And uh, he, we two of us bought a ticket in it anyway. So when we bought the ticket, Barney rang me up and he said, uh, we had a kind of a an agreement here that the first trainer that buy a ticket in this raffle that we'd send him a horse. He said, would you train a horse for me? And I said, sure, I'd train for anyone. Barney says, as long as you pay me. Oh, he said, I'll pay you. So anyway, he said, come down, he said, and I'll, I'll show you the horse. So I went down to the house and it was an enormous big place. It was a huge, I just can't think of the name of it now, but it was one of those old, uh, um, 
estates and it was huge but all the I was waiting to, I was told to go in and wait in the, in, the, in, the, in the sitting room and when I went into the sitting room you could see where all the big paintings had been hanging on the walls but they were all gone and Barney had covered up the blanks with photographs so there were photographs of horses up on the walls and silver book and uh, oh, those couple of brilliant horses forgive and forget and all this and they were all around the walls but over the mantelpiece there was a huge big photograph of this horse crashing through a hurdle in Sedgefield, a selling hurdle, a pair of blinkers on him and he crashed over the lap. So when he came into the room I said to him, I can't understand what I said. I said all these fabulous horses around the walls, I said, but the biggest photograph you have is a horse over the mantelpiece, I said, is a horse winning in a, in a, in a uh, selling hurdle in Sedgefield. Yeah, he said, you know, he said, they were all great horses, he says, but that's the fill I got the most money out of. <laughs> that was very funny. Anyway, the long and the short of it, we were brought down to see this horse, and this horse was pulled out by Keyside, big chestnut horse, and uh, or bay horse, and uh, he came out. It was just, was he chestnut? White face, anyway. But anyway, uh, I said, Do you like him? I said, Fine, yeah. So up he came, anyway. So we had him for about a month, and uh, he didn't do it much more than hacking around. We just started him from scratch and he was hacking around, hacking around. And then he went lame. And we could never work out why he was lame. He was, he was just lame. So we had farriers and vets and everything, but we never found out why he was lame, he was just lame. So eventually, anyway, I said to Barney, look, I said, you may take him home. I said, I, I, I can't. he's lame, I don't know what's wrong with him. So he went home anyway. And uh, about six months later, I'd say, or maybe, maybe longer, I don't know how long it was. He rings me up and he said, uh, that horse you had with me, he said, uh, uh, was he any good? Or I had with uh, I said, to be honest, I don't know. I said, he never, we only hacked him. I said, I have to say, you now he was a very poor mover. I said, the chances are he's not, you know. Oh, he said, I'm getting four grand for him. He said, that's nice, sir. fair enough, fair enough. So he sells the horse anyway, and the horse turned out to be Omerta. Homer Scott got him and he won five or six in a row, finishing up winning the four mile chase in Cheltenham. Uh, he ended up, Martin Pipe got him and he won the Kim Yo with him and the Irish National. So he was, uh, the, you asked me if I won get away, he got away. It, it's where everybody really, and the trains jumpers want to win. And you, it's, it's, it's a fabulous place to win. But it's, it's a heartbreak as well for, for to get beat. It, it's a very, very lonely place when you're not in the first four. If you get in the first four, you get into the top parade ring to end saddle up there, that's fine. But if you run, and the percentage of horses that will run at Jetland will run down the field, you know, and, and the, only so many can run in the first four, unless you have the, the numbers of good ones that, that like, and you will find now even next week or the week after, a Willie will probably bring he probably bring 75 or 80 horses to Cheltenham. And he'll win. I don't know how many he'll win. But he, forgetting about how many he'll win, he will have probably 50% of those will run bad. You know, and someone owns them too, you know. And, they, and you, have to, you have to take that and, 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 and walk away. So, so it's... it's, it's um, and I don't think it's the hill or anything that makes horse that kills horses in Cheltenham or anything like that. I think it's the actual racing is so strong. But you can end a horse's season in Cheltenham, no question or doubt about that. Like if he has a very hard race there. Like people are bringing horses over back to England to run in Cheltenham. Gavin has been over there three or four times and is, he's a heap of winners in Cheltenham this year already. And his horses have come back and they've won. So it's, I don't think people say, oh, the hill kills them. It's not the hill that kills them. It's the competition that kills them. If, they're, if you wind them up for it and, you have, and they have very hard races, that's what, that's what kills them, you know. I always regarded Cheltenham as a championship situation. And I know that... Uh, I, I always felt that, that if you're going to Cheltenham, you're going over there to win a, to win a grade one or to win, to win one of the champ, championship races. So I probably could have won more races in Cheltenham had I, I, I hit it lower and went for handicaps. But to me, that wasn't what uh, Cheltenham was about. Cheltenham was about trying to win the champion hurdle or the Gold Cup and the, and the Supreme Novice. And the, you know, that was the way I always felt about Cheltenham. I said, I'd rather, I wanted to win that. Like Harbour Pilot on 
probably would have won the handicap chase that year if I run him in that instead of the Gold Cup. But I didn't. I wanted to win the Gold Cup and I'd try and win the Gold Cup, and and that was why I did that. And it probably there was other horses that that I did that 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 um, that were the same. I remember like. Uh, Road to Respect went, and he he was supposed to run in the in the three mile novels. And Eddie says, "Oh, he says we better go for the for the handicap." And sure, he bolted up in the handicap, uh, in 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 handicap. And the following year, he was placed in the Gold Cup. So, like, I mean, he was he was, uh, uh, and he won it. He won the he won the Irish Gold Cup, or the one in Ireland. So he was he was he was a proper grade one horse in a handicap. But uh, to me. It, Cheltenham was all about was always about. I don't think it is anymore. It's been it's been diluted a lot. I don't think people or people now are sort of oh I'll win the Martin Pipe or win the Carl Cup or win the Pertemps or whatever. But uh, to me that wasn't what Cheltenham was about. I was lucky enough now to have all the best jockeys ride for me over the years. I started off originally, I suppose the earliest one that uh, on the over jumps was Carmody. Um, he used to. Tommy was was a very very good rider. Not great with uh, with um, humans. Very good with horses, but not great with humans. And so much so, I'll never forget. He was when he'd ride a horse. He was riding for Mulherrin at the time, but he'd given. He said to me, "I'll ride for you if you fancy yours, as long as John has nothing in it." So I said, "That's fine." So I'd only get him when 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 when. Yeah, we thought we had a chance, you see. So that meant that Tommy, when Tommy was riding, he thought he was going to win. Now, that's fine. But win, lose or draw, Tommy thought the horse was going to do what he was going to do. So he'd come in after the race, and if he won, and the owners would be jumping up and down and delighted and every this, that and that. And as far as Tommy was concerned, he just won because he'd done what he was supposed to do. And he says, and uh, he's not much good, but he won. You know, that was kind of his attitude. And if he lost, he was only... Uh, you know, Jesus, the names he called them wouldn't be great. So the first thing you do when he, when Tommy was riding for you was when you get down to the winner's enclosure or wherever your enclosure is, OK, Tom, good luck now, and get him away as quick as you could before the owners would ride back. Because in in, in 30 seconds, Tommy would say to him, I, I'm, I, if he sees this, he'll kill me. But well, I haven't seen him for a while. I hope he's well. Um, and then I, I had Charlie. Charlie rode a lot for us, a lot of winners for us. And he was a brilliant rider. Oh, he's a brilliant rider. I'm not sure if he wasn't the best rider of them, a whole lot of them. Like, he rarely made a mistake. He didn't make a mistake. And when Charlie was riding for you, he knew what everybody else was going to do. He knew what the, the what ground they went on, how far they went, and who, who, who was going to make the run. He knew everything. He had the whole thing summed up. Done what he wanted. Uh, he could beat a short head in the, in the Arkle on Hill Society. For me, and he won the he won the race on on on, um, on Johnny Satterside in Leopardstown. Um, brilliant rider, of course, brilliant rider, but um, nod man, but brilliant rider, brilliant. Um, and AP was a brilliant rider, uh, rode a few winners for me as well. And Barry started with me and. Uh, he was with me for, he was champion jockey, I think he was champion jockey twice with us, when he was with us, when Paul was in England. Um, very, very strong rider, very, very good rider. Um, and uh, Paul, of course, was with us for a long, long time then. He was with us for, for 20 years, I think, for a long, I don't know. Um, as I say, he was, he, was, he was a special rider, but could have been so much better if he just applied himself a little better. But look, he was probably Paul was Paul and that was it. But he was a brilliant, brilliant rider. It was great having Nina here for so long. She was Nina was absolutely brilliant. She was a brilliant brilliant person. She still is she's a fabulous person. And she's a she's a perfectionist. And she was she was a great rider as well. And uh, on the flat, I was lucky enough to have uh, um, Wally Swinburne, old Wally used to ride for me quite a bit early on, and uh, then he won. He rode the mare on the filly when she won a Royal Ascot, and uh, then Stephen came to me, Stephen Crane, and we had great times together. He 
he was I, I still to this day enjoy him he's, he's, a, he's a lovely man and we had great fun and uh, now we're lucky enough that we have Colin riding for us whenever he can early on obviously winning at Ascot but it kind of went over my head a little bit because I thought it was simple I thought I'd win I thought it was easy to win at Ascot when I went over and I won um, and I think the, the first year the pinch hitter won the Galway hurdle uh, that was huge at the time I know it's only an ordinary handicap or such now but that was huge at the time for me and I got a great kick out of it and even though he didn't win I got a great kick out of Sunshine Street in the Derby and, and whatever and like um, that I, I know he only finished fourth and whatever and that probably wouldn't be anybody's any of that but, but uh, I did get good kick out of that I'd be pretty good friends with everybody now Gordon and myself be good friends I was always good friends with Willie uh, go, and we're, I'm very good friends with Gordon. We go to football matches together. We do. We go to see Mead play, and and uh, we talk regularly. It was always very good pals with Willie and uh, Eric McNamara is a very good pal of mine. And um, I know Paul Nolan and um, most of them. I, there'll be very few people now that I wouldn't uh, that I wouldn't get on with. I I I, I would I would be pally with most of the lads now. Ada was a, is, a, is a very good friend of mine as well, and um, I, I, uh, no, I, 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 I always be happy. Over the years now, we, we, we always got on. There's very few fellas that I didn't get on with racing anyway. I, I can't think of a trainer now that I just don't get on. With. I can think of a few. I can think of a few people I don't get on with. All right, but we we'll leave that. We we'll leave that one sit. It's very easy to have the best looking horse in the parade ring and he and he looks great and he looks like he's in the in Dublin show but he, he won't win because you have to train them if you don't train them they won't win and and you have to be hard on them and and like there's no easy way of doing that it doesn't matter it doesn't matter like now there might be a lot of different ways of training them but they still you still have to get them to that pitch now some lads might take a bit longer to get there but and different ways of doing it but you still have to get them to that, and there's no such thing as just tootling around and you have them right on the day. That doesn't work. They have to be fit. Well, I think training methods have certainly changed. Martin Pipe saw to that. He he was he was he revolutionised training really, and and uh, he was he was you know he what he did. Everybody tried to copy him. The only thing Martin did wrong was he shouldn't have wrote the book. <laughs> he should have kept it to himself. But anyway, uh, I suppose it would spread. And now, of course, you have Willie, and. Everybody, you know, Willie trains up to his, uh, into in a, in, a, in, a, in a gallop that's a foot deep, and it can't be deep enough as far as Willie's concerned. And he's but once you, you get the system that works for you, you just have to keep doing it, and you have to keep after it. But nobody wait, the trouble about training is nobody waits for you. Like I mean, you can't take time out. You just got to keep going, and. The, the the great trainers are that's why they were so good they just kept going and at it and at it and at it they're constant and it is a constant business whether it be on that at least on the flat when there was no all weather you got the winter off but in the in, on jumpers there's nearly no off at all you know you're at it the whole way but um has it changed yes it has changed big time and the fact that there was a time years ago you could run a horse that would be 50 60 percent fit and he'd finish if you ran a horse now that was 50 or 60 percent fit, he wouldn't get halfway around because he wouldn't be able to. I don't know. He wouldn't finish. He just wouldn't finish. And that's uh, whether it's the fact that the others are going faster or harder or what I don't know. But he just wouldn't finish. The point of pointers have become a huge business. Uh, like and they are fabulous trainers. Those, there's a there's a couple of guys in in Wexford uh, who are as good a trainers as we've seen, like they they're they're, they're unreal. They're that good. Uh, how they can get four year olds to do what they can do and get them to the races? Are they too hard on them? Probably, but like I mean that's the business they're in. Uh, the French seem to be able to do it and get away with it, and and uh, so I suppose we ha you have to get them horses to that pitch. But they're, 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 they're probably, there's probably, if you look at it a different way, there's not that many horses that stay in training for more than three or four years. Most horses don't last any long. You get an odd one, 
You get like that's I think Cato Star was one of the best horses of all time because he tried to kill himself every year. And yet he stayed. He lasted through the whole of his of his of his time, and nothing ever went. He was sound. He was must have been the soundest horse ever. And um, but but uh, the the most of them, you know, they have three years, four years. If you get very few of them, get a lot longer than that. Not one here and there too. Ah, uh, look at the Hardy you push horses. It's, 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 there's no question. There's no question about that. The more you push them, the more chance you have of putting them, of breaking them up. Like, I mean, if you don't do much with them, you're, you're, you're a better chance. And I suppose to give them the time is the whole, is the, is the. Well, I just couldn't buy them. I, I, like, I used to buy, I used to buy about 15 stores every year. And I would buy them to a price. Like, I was sort of, pr probably... 40 was probably the max of me, maybe 30 I'd be thinking of, you know. But I couldn't get anything that was that, at that money. There was no way. And the last uh, year that I did it, I had, oh, I had about four or five at the end that I hadn't sold and they were standing me, they were, they were 40,000 or 45 and they were standing me, standing me at that time and, and it had, they didn't get sold, and and they were no good. And I sold them for you know they went to us as right as ha happy hackers, for for nothing you know. So I just said this is not on. So I I I stopped buying them. I just stopped. I haven't bought like a very few stores over the last couple of years, and uh, I I was able to go to the yearling sales, and buy yearlings for that sort of money, from you know forty back. And, and and whatever, and if you're lucky enough to have someone to give a few quid, you, you still could buy a reasonable horse, 50, 60. Whereas the, you couldn't, the, the, the point, point men are given a hundred for one now. So it just didn't make sense to me. For the last year or so, we've been lucky enough in the sales with selling horses. The trouble about that is that you're selling away. Like last year, we, we sold six, six of the two year olds, I think, or seven maybe. And, but all your, you're, you're selling all your your, your 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 good ones, you know, and 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 uh, you're you're left with what's well the ordinary ones. So you have to be careful that that you don't end up the wrong side of it doing that. But we have been lucky, and the and the, and the, the money the money is fantastic if they go to Hong Kong or or um, the Far East or Australia, or whatever. The money is great, so so you can't. Over the last number of years now, we've been we've been very lucky with them. I'd like Arsenal to move as well. Obviously, you'd like you'd like to buy the pedigrees, but to be honest, the easiest thing in the world to do is to find the most expensive horse in the sale. It's to find one that's not the most expensive horse in the sale that you can afford and still go. So that's what we're still at. We're still trying to buy the try, trying to buy the nice horse with with the, the and sort of fit in as much pedigree as you can. Big into confirmation, and yet I would forgive a bit if we liked to look at the way he, he travelled. You know, if he was, if he, if he had a, if we, if we had, were, we thought he was athletic. That we, we, but I'd be, I, we would be big into confirmation. Yeah, actually, look, if you're going to sell them, you have to. I had a few horses with own Banville over the years, and and uh, a few mares, sorry, with him, and uh, we haven't had a great lot of success. But but uh, I'd say I'm the bane of Owen's life now. To be honest with you. To be honest with you, racing has probably changed for the better. Uh, the the jockeys, because uh, look better, and to be honest, they probably ride better because they can see themselves. Years ago, they didn't see themselves. There was no film. There was no. They never saw a rerun. They never got a chance to see that there were like a lot of lads was was that half. Well, I wouldn't say the half of them, but. So there's a lot of fellas calling cabs and whatever that you never see now. Like, I mean, if you see, if you went to the races today, uh, to a jump meeting today, and you saw one fella calling a cab, you'd be talking about it on the way home. Then, like, they all rode back and out the back. Now, the fences were probably stiffer, and there was drops at the back of a lot of them. So probably that was something to do with it. But, but the, you don't see... Jockeys are much better, or look much better now in the saddle than they used to. But that's again, they're able to, to come in and they're able to look at themselves and see what they're doing right and see what they're doing wrong. So that's a big help. And probably uh, they're maybe better coached now than they were, uh, which is a big help. Um, 
the is is it changed? Oh yeah, it's changed big time. I, I don't think there's as much fun in it now as there used to be. I, I don't think there is. And I suppose there's a couple of things for that reason. Um, I, maybe it's good and bad, but I, I'd say people used to go to the races and of course they'd have a few drinks and at that time they'd drive home and whatever and they never thought any more about it. And uh, that's that's the way it was. And But when drink driving probably well, obviously that's a good thing, but it still had a big effect on race, and I think a bigger effect than anybody ever thinks about. I think it has had a huge effect because now, if you want, to, if you go to races, and if you want to have a drink, you must have a driver with you because that's the only way out of it. Um, the I I think too that 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 uh, it, it's more commercial now than it was. But that's probably the advent of television as well. Like everything is, is, is uh, you know, everybody is criticised for doing this or doing that or, you know, like, so I think there's quite a bit of that in it as well, you know. Like there's more publicity, the, 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 the websites and you have people coming in from different directions on the, on, you know, if you, I don't know, even football matches at the moment now, if you, you listen to the pundits after, you just wonder how fellas play football at all now because they're, they, they should be here and they should be there. And all that. It's the same thing with jockeys. I think they're, you know, they're, they, they get criticism. Maybe some of it is good. Sure, the trainers and probably don't go racing half as much now because they can see it at home. And if the owners are not going because they're looking at it at home. And probably, like, the likes of... Uh, that's probably the big owners. Their owners are bigger than we used to have. Like, I mean, sure, uh, with no disrespect to the Arabs, like, they wouldn't go racing. They, um, they, they, a lot of the major, the major jumps owners mightn't go racing because they can watch it on TV unless it's a big meeting. But I think we've got to that stage now that we're into festival racing and that's the way it works. And it does work. And, I, and probably the, those, those midweek races and meetings and whatever, they might be better off if everybody's let in free. Now, I don't think it'll make a lot of difference, because I don't think it'll make a lot, make a lot of difference, to be honest with you. Like, years ago, like, I mean, it was a big thing to be on television. If RTE were doing it or whatever, were doing the thing, it'd be a big thing to be interviewed. And you'd, if you were had a tape recorder, you'd come home and you'd look at it again. Now you wouldn't bother. But, but because you get interviewed, and you are, you, you, you would try to mind your P's and Q's a bit. And, and I suppose you get, you get, a lot of trainers get used to it. And, and like, probably with flat horses and, 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 and that are, like, I, well, look, I might as well say it, I was thinking, but Aidan, for instance, now he has to be careful what he says about any horse. You know, he's, he, all his uh, horses are potential stallions. Yeah. So he's got to be careful that uh, he doesn't get quoted the wrong way uh, over, the, over the, you know, in, in, in the coming period, in the coming times that he doesn't get caught up in that. So I'd say Aidan, Aidan is, has to be careful and probably some of the, you know, if you have a horse that's going to be as a potential as a stallion. And sometimes I suppose you just have to be careful what you say. I oh, sure look at I'm uh, an avid mead football fan um, and would try and I, I, I don't know when I last missed a championship match but I try and get to the league matches as well I try to get as many of them as I can and uh, sure we've been struggling for the last couple of years anyway and now we have Callum and Barry Callaghan and a few more of the lads in there trying to sort things out so we're after winning our last two matches so we're I'm not saying we're going anywhere in a hurry, but at least you think we're, got, we're winning a few matches. I played golf, but I was no good at it. I, 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 ne I, I didn't particularly like it, to be honest with you. And when you don't like something, it's not... It's not uh, it was a bit like going back to my mother in the ball game. I think that was the balls just didn't suit me. But, but uh, um, no, I, 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 I played it. And, and I suppose, to be honest with you, the, the best part of it for me was the 19th. But, but uh, I was, I was, I, I hunted a lot early on, years ago. And, but I haven't hunted now for, for, for uh, 15 years or so, but maybe longer, I don't know. But, but the last time I rode a horse was in Keeney, actually, on a safari. But uh, uh, I enjoyed hunting. Hunting was good, was good fun. 
look what I like to, I like the people at the I meet racing. I like the, I like I like my colleagues. I like meeting them and I like I like having a bit of crack with them and whatever. And and, and I like training for people I like. Uh, and uh, I I I just get it hard to I get it hard to put up with fellas I don't like to be honest. <laughs> but 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 uh, um, I uh, I don't know. I just. I love going racing, and, and 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 I love going racing to see my horses run. And and I'm not sure I'd like to go racing, but I didn't have any horses running because I was in Gorn there recently, and and uh, we had a runner in late on, and you know Gorn is so hard to get in and out of on Tiesta's day, and I said we better go early uh, because we we parked in a hundred miles away or whatever. I says we'll go early, so we arrived early, and and then we didn't have a runner till the second last or something like that and I actually said to Derville halfway through the day what do people do with the race <laughs> it's just getting it's getting browned off but it, it is it is uh, I don't think I would be going racing if I didn't have if I didn't have runners but I like, uh, I like going racing with runners one of my greatest sayings is that you'll be millions and millions of years dead so I always say if you can do it you should do it because you're going to be millions and millions of years dead but um I suppose the best piece of advice I ever got was from JP, and he says, he, JP says, yeah, you rarely improve your position by speaking. <laughs> I still enjoy training horses, and uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I haven't as many now as I had, and I'm, I'm not that unhappy about that. I'm happy enough with what we have, and I have a couple of great people around me, like I have, I have um, Emma. Connolly and, and Damien McGillick and Paul Cullen, those three guys are, are have been with me for so long, or three, Emma obviously Karen, they've been with me for so long now and I couldn't, I have to be honest, I don't think I could get on without them, I, I couldn't I, I couldn't imagine training without Emma and Les and, and or Damien and, and Paul, it just wouldn't be, but because they they call a lot of the shots now as far as you know they they look after the horses more than I do now at this stage because they're they're on the ball all the time and they're, they're there and we and we work well together